interactions which actually almost exhausts interactions. Uh, in the future we will we'll talk, uh, I mean we will be in the second semester and, and uh, sometimes later in, in this semester we will have, uh, uh, we will discuss some other interactions but with these interactions which we will cover today actually most of engineering problems can be uh, can be analyzed. All right, so we discussed, um, how about if you refresh our memory which uh, interactions we uh, we uh, reviewed so far in the order we, we uh, they were presented here. So the first one was gravity, gravitational interaction. Okay, then the next one, support, right? Uh, uh, and the f uh, um, I mean, we described so far all interactions in terms of force. You remember that uh, we can describe it in terms of other quantities as well. So, uh, but so you can say that I support is a type of interaction, and then the normal force is correct. I will accept this as the answer as well. All right. The next one was static friction. Correct. Uh, now, <coughs> all of those three, which uh, which adjust themselves to the situation. In other words, I refer to them as smart forces. Normal force adjusts itself and static friction. Okay. Today I'm going to talk about kinetic friction, which is dumb. It does not adjust itself. Uh, <coughs> and uh, however, it, it appears also at the, uh, uh, also at the, uh, when the two surfaces are in contact. Um, however, now um, the value of, of the magnitude of that force is fixed. It depends on the certain coefficient referred to as coefficient of kinetic friction and uh, the normal force, the magnitude of the normal force between the two surfaces. In other words, how strong the two surfaces are pushed against each other. Um, all right, usually, I mean, it's very, very rare that kinetic friction uh, well, uh, will be in a static, well, not definitely not in a static situation, it's just that usually there will be a result on the net force from, from it. If the three forces, if the three forces, if uh, balance each other, it, which means that they add up to a zero vector so that the net force is going to be zero, what the object is going to do? Stay still, wrong answer. It's not going to accelerate, correct? It won't be accelerating. Why it cannot be still? Because, because what? No, there will be friction. I said that the, that the kinetic friction, uh, the value of kinetic friction is such that it, it balances the other, uh, the other two forces on this inclined surface. Uh, so I said that there is kinetic friction. Uh, Jessica wants to say something else. There is no... Static friction, correct. How can be static friction if the surface is sliding? Uh, on a ramp, however, we can have a situation that's, that an object is moving and, uh, and there is a static friction. What type of a situation it would have to be? Something is going to roll from that, from, uh, along that surface, yes. So if something is rolling, and we will have static friction, uh, however the object is moving and it can even accelerate. Um, well, depending, uh, um, I, make, I, I plot here, uh, what happens actually if I, if I have an object and I start, how about if I you imagine that I have this object and I ap apply stronger and stronger force. I push it stronger and stronger. Well, if I start with a force of magnitude zero, static, I mean, on a horizontal surface, on a horizontal surface, uh, uh, so, so that all external forces add up, except for the static friction, add up to zero. Then static friction will adjust itself to that particular situation, which means that it would adjust itself to what value? Zero, correct. It doesn't, it doesn't need it. 
Yeah, so so uh, like right now, static friction uh, for uh, static frictional force exerted on me is zero. The uh, the support and gr and uh, weight balance each other, so so that that other one is not needed. Now, if I push it, and now it doesn't slide, uh, but I am pushing now, so I'm pushing it to your right. How come that it is not sliding? Static friction adjusts itself to to make sure that that, that all uh, four forces add up to a zero vector, so it does not that does not accelerate. And so, oops. So what happens is that as I increase the uh, the external forces al along the surface, so uh, the static frictional force also increases proportionally and it increases until it reaches its maximum value that maximum value is determined by what by the surfaces and more precisely what quantity characterizing the surfaces coefficient of static friction and the normal force correct uh, well, if uh, if I push stronger than that, I will break actually that static friction, and it will start to slide. The frictional force will drop. So either the object is going to accelerate, or the object will not allow me to exert uh, as big force as I w I wanted before. Uh, so actually, uh, this line. I mean, this is line, what would happen if you increase the force and, and consistently with this one, at this point, uh, object would accelerate. However, what can also happen is that, that I could extend that line to the left. This would make sense as well. All right. The next interaction which is uh, in this chapter is uh, tension. Very often, actually, we, we assign tension uh, force to to place where the, where the tension force is not exerted, uh, which which actually is okay. Uh, like uh, in, a, in a typical situation uh, in which something like this happens is, let's say, with with this yo-yo. Uh, so so for example, if I hold it, probably. Most say that, that there was a tension force exerted. So tension forces are exerted by various types of cord, chains, cables, as when they are being stretched. Uh, more precisely, actually, uh, that I would have to, to consider this part of the, of the string as a part, as, as a part of the yo-yo. So, so tension force, I, let's say, is exerted by the top part of the string on the bottom part of the string. If you, if you analyze precisely what force the string exerts on the yo-yo over there when it is wound, it is still the, it's the support. It's a normal force, really. And uh, also, I mean, if you, if, you, if you think about the joints over here where the, where the rope is connected to that crate, yeah, there, will, there will be a loop, right? And in that loop, really, it will have forces like this. So, so, so precisely, it's a normal force. However, in the string, you can think everywhere along the string, one part of a string exerts another part on the, uh, exerts a tension force on another part of the string. Precisely, you could uh, uh, you could think about tension forces with something is glued to a surface. If you glue something to a surface and then you pull on it then uh, in that glue, uh, or that glue exerts a tension force on the surface uh, to which we glued something. You can think about uh, uh, this tension force like something opposite to, to, to what? To what? No, to the normal force, right. Norm in a normal force, the two surfaces are squeezed against each other and tension exists when you pull surfaces each, uh, against each other. So I can, I can exert uh, a normal force uh, uh, um, between the hands. I mean, there is a normal force between the hands, 
I cannot actually uh, exert tension force between the hands. Uh, however, if I use a super glue and hold it for a while, then I can, one hand can exert a tension force uh, on another uh, uh, hand. Tension force is also a smart force, so it adjusts itself to, to the situation. Uh, uh, so, for example, <coughs> yeah, right, like right now, if the if that crate is hanging on the uh, on that rope, uh, relate that that tension force, let's say, in the string over here. So consider that this part is is the object. Yes. Yeah, so, con uh, so consider now, evaluate that that tension force at this location compared to the weight of the crate. We have to imagine a free body diagram. So let's try to identify all the forces exerted on this object. Mm. What are they? Gravitational. Yeah, there is a gravitational force. And tension adjusts itself to prevent that object uh, to leave. Uh, 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 I mean, to, to leave this position. What, uh, what other forces are exerted on this system? Actually, I want you to go only through the forces which, which we discussed. Yeah, I will always uh, pick situations uh, in which uh, we discuss uh, forces. So right now, you have four choices. And actually, when, when you are going through, uh, when you are constructing a free body diagram, do the same thing. Go through all possible forces and think, is it exerted and what exerts it on the object? So. Uh, we took care of gravity. We recognized that there's gravitational force. The next one was no normal force. Normal force. It's exerted. It's normal force exerted here. What exerts it? The rope on what? Well, we are talking about uh, forces exerted. Ah, this. Oh, yeah. This is a good thing. That I'm. Thank you for bringing this thing up. When we discuss, can we recall Newton's second law? What force is, uh, relates uh, uh, interaction with uh, motion uh, in Newton's second law? What force do we have to consider to, to find out acceleration of an object? Mass is not a force. Acceleration is not a force. Inertia is not a force. Gravity is a force, but no. The reference frame is, okay, let's go, let's answer those three questions. Uh, what exerts the reference frame on what and, and what is the type, uh, I mean the reference frame is the type of interaction, I understand, right? Reference frame is not an interaction, it's not a force, we don't have force called reference frame. Which force is, yeah, uh, can, we re can we recall the formula? Net force, correct. This is the net force. By the way, let's try to answer those, those three questions. What exerts the net force? Not any. W did you say any? No, not any. Who exerts, uh, what exerts a net force on me? Gravity cannot exert a force because it's not an object. Earth, Earth, that, correct. Earth is exerting a force, but Earth is not exerting the net force. Earth is exerting gravitational force on me. Who is exerting the net force? I'm not interacting with myself. <coughs> I mean, I cannot lift myself like that. Who exerts the net force? Well, let's find out who exerts a force. So Earth is exerting a force. Who else? The floor, okay. The Earth, the floor, who else? Friction is not an object. A what? Who else, or what else? The, uh, actually, this is the most difficult decision which you are, uh, which you are supposed to make now. A uh, what? No. 
I mean, air is exerting, air is exerting a force on me, indeed. Uh, it is a tiny force which we will discuss in the future. It is not one of the four <laughs> forces which we discussed so far, so it's illegal. Uh, 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 although it is true, uh, earth, uh, air is really exerting a, a buoyant force on me. Very tiny, so I'm not floating like a balloon. Uh, and, and actually, I don't even feel this, uh, this buoyant force. It's very tiny. Uh, I mean, it's more than the weight of the mouse, though. Uh, uh, so what else? And, I, and really, the decision is very difficult. And you, do you have an idea? Static frictional force is not an object. The ground, we already covered ground here yeah, because floor is the ground here. Yeah, so what else? <laughs> no. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> That's it. You have, to, you, you, you have to make a decision. Yeah, in physics or engineering, the more is not better. The more, I mean, too much is as bad as too little. If you include if you create too many forces exerted on an object, your, uh, your uh, prediction will be as bad as if you miss a force. So nothing else exert is exerting a force. So who, who is exerting the net force? I'll let's recall what net force is. Some of all forces exerted on me. Right, so who exerts it? Earth and the floor together. Earth and the floor together exert that force. Now, uh, think about yourself. Yeah, because uh, in case of yourself, uh, J Jessica, how, uh, can you imagine forces exerted on you? L let's at the location where you are now. Who? Uh, what objects interact with you? The chair. The chair additionally. Additionally, the chair. The floor is exerting a force on her, the chair is exerting a force on her, and earth is exerting force on her. Who is exerting the net force on Jessica? All three together, correct. Net force is not really a type of interaction. It includes all types of interactions and all, uh, all objects which interact with the particular object. However, Newton's second law, requires that, that f what net force uh, is, uh, is mentioned in Newton's second law. Uh, how about if we actually recall Newton's second law? We have already discussed that. Uh, because uh, really comprehension of the Newton's law and, and proper application is very important in predicting what will happen. Can you say Newton's second law? Anybody? F equals ma. I love it. Yeah. Okay, in which, which language it is? Okay, now, so now we have actually to explain what is what of what. So what is, uh, let's start, uh, let's start what is F. It's the net force. Uh, I, I'm, it's too ambiguous. Which net force? Exerted on the object, correct. It is the net force exerted on the object. Now, and here I had a complaint about the force. I forgot what, what, uh, uh, what force did you identify over here. But the force exerted on that beam is irrelevant to the motion of the crate. We should not include that, that, uh, th this force when we analyze forces exerted on the crate. Only forces exerted on the crate. All right, so let's come back to that. By the way, uh, what, uh, what is A in, the, uh, in Newton's second law? What acceleration? Acceleration due to gravity is wrong. Of what? Acceleration of the object I, I, I buy, but uh, I don't understand this to the reference frame. Because if it is acceleration of the object, 
I accept that we still have to specify which acceleration of the object. R really, actually, so far we, we discussed a version in which there was not acceleration of the object, but it was acceleration of a particle. particle. Right now, we didn't even talk about objects. We, uh, we approximate everything by a particle. Uh, when we will really start to talk about objects, we will refer to acceleration of the center of mass of the object. But uh, no matter which version of Newton's second law we, we discuss, we will have to specify which acceleration of the object or which acceleration of the particle we are talking about. A very important statement. How we look at that acceleration. In an inertial reference frame. We cannot look at acceleration of a coffee mug on a dashboard from the reference frame of the car and related to the net force. We have to look at the at that uh, mark from the ref inertial reference frame of the road. How to, I mean, I will also show uh, you how, to, what to do in non-inertial reference frames. We will introduce something which is uh, often referred as pseudo forces or inertial forces and they are not really forces, they are effects resulting from non-inertiality of the reference frame. All right, so coming back to this one, we have gravitational force and tension force, and what else? That's it. That's it, make sure to stop at the right point. Usually, I mean, it's very rare that you will find an object on which more than five forces are exerted. All right, uh, now there are some, some forces which actually are not uh, listed in the, uh, in the chapter. Uh, however, they appear uh, in, the, uh, in the problems at the back. So I thought that I will include them too. Uh, actually, uh, drag is uh, discussed in the, uh, in the, ch uh, uh, in the uh, chapter. It's possible that I don't, that didn't include this because I prepared this slide just yesterday. So it's possible, I don't think... It's possible that you don't have it uh, in the notes. Um, <coughs> well, uh, dr drag forces and skin friction, I mean, th these are forces similar to, to, kinetic, uh, to kinetic friction. Actually, uh, uh, skin friction is considered to, to be a, just a kinetic friction, and it both of those uh, forces are exerted uh, on, on an object if, it, if the object is moving uh, in the fluid or the fluid is moving around the object. So for example, if, you are, if I walk, if I walk, there is uh, interaction between air and me. Uh, and, uh, and engineering, actually it is pretty uh, important uh, uh, interaction because when we drive a car drag force is significant when we fly a plane the, f the drag force on the plane is is very significant um, or, or ride the bicycle when I walk actually we can ignore it because when we walk that force is, is, is tiny actually you can you can test uh, how strong is the drag force when you drive your car. Uh, I mean, since we have such a nice uh, uh, weather outside, open your windows and pull out your hand and see how that air is going to push your hand and how it depends on the speed. So you will see that if you drive 10 miles per hour, or if I walk like that, I don't really feel that, that my hand is being pushed. However, if you drive 55 miles per hour, you, you will, you will feel that the hand is pushed pr quite strongly. Uh, depending on this, what is the relative speed of the fluid and the object, uh, we can have a situation that the uh, force is exerted, at, and this happens at low speeds, on the side surface. So it looks exactly like friction, except that, that here uh, the... Uh, uh, it's not between two rigid surfaces, but between a fluid and a surface. 
there is also a difference that it is, uh, it's not smart force like uh, similarly to kinetic friction, but it is not fixed. That friction, uh, that frictional force or skin friction is proportional to the relative speed of the uh, uh, object in the fluid. Yeah, so, so if the object travels this way, this uh, skin friction, it is also sometimes referred as viscous drag. Uh, <coughs> now, if object moves really fast, uh, then, uh, then we have a, another relationship between velocity and that, and that force, and it results actually from the air in front being squeezed. So, so, so rather than kinetic, I mean, this, this uh, skin friction is really similar to, to uh, kinetic friction. This one is more uh, similar to the normal force. So, uh, and uh, it is referred to as pressure drag. And pressure drag is also opposite to the relative uh, velocity. And it's derivable, actually. And uh, it depends on uh, uh, drag coefficient. This D stands for drag coefficient. In some books, you can find it as C uh, or C sub D. Uh, rho is the density of the fluid. A is the, uh, it's kind of front view cross-sectional uh, area. So, so like in case of the ball traveling to the left, you will have to, to see what, uh, well, how would you see that ball from this side? So pra practically, I mean, this circle would be, uh, would be A, ho however, in facing that direction. Uh, v here is the speed, so if you double the speed, this force actually quadruples. Uh, th this force uh, is responsible actually for, the, uh, for air resistance where uh, you drive a car. And uh, uh, <coughs> so if you, this formula actually prompted speed limit. Yeah, because now think about if you drive from one point to another point with uh, uh, speed, f let's say, 40 miles per hour, and then, well, no, at that time probably there was no limit. So how about if you think of that, that 60 miles per hour and 120 miles per hour when there were no speed limit? Uh, so when there were no speed limit, the sp we could travel 120 miles per hour. However, the drag force was how many times greater than at 60 miles per hour? Four times, right? So you reduce speed by half, and you decrease the force by, uh, by a factor of four, uh, which actually resulted in uh, less fuel consumption. The lower we, we, we move, the less fuel we have to use. Um, all right. Now, another force which occurs also in uh, objects moving, particularly in air, although it could be in any fluid, so in water it, you can have it as well, is lift. And uh, uh, lift results, it's, it's kind of, um, uh, well, results from a normal force which, which uh, a surface of, uh, a surface exerts on, on the fluid, uh, although not only from normal force, because on the other side there is another uh, kind of a force, uh, I mean, on, on the top of the wing. But in, in summary, what happens is that, uh, that an object, let's uh, say, if, this, if I have this object and air flows, this object pushes the air down and actually it accelerates down. Uh, I mean, soon after it leaves the wing, that air below will make sure that, that the air flows in the same direction. But for a moment, the wing actually act pushes, uh, uh, I mean, uh, deflects that flow of air downward. Over here, you can see that the air is flowing at an angle downward. 
uh, determined by this angle of attack of the wing. And I found here a picture, actually, what happens if a plane flies just above a, uh, above a cloud. So that air blown down by the wing makes this trail uh, uh, behind it. Uh, actually, this is the Kanda effect. Uh, and, uh, well, you can look at this from the point of view of Newton's third law. The wing is pushing the air downward, accelerating the air downward. Well, therefore, what the air does? Pushes the plane upward. And this is the lift. Uh, and one more, one more uh, force it's, uh, which propels uh, a plane uh, is a thrust. And thrust is a force which is uh, exerted by expelled expelled or, or accelerated fluid. I mean, here are a few examples of, of uh, thrust. Um, so from a jet engine, jet engine simply blows or ejects uh, gas at a high speed over here. And therefore, this gas exerts as a reaction, according to Newton's third law, uh, uh, forward, forward force of the plane, plane. We refer to this as as thrust. We can have thrust also from a propeller. I mean, pro you can look at a propeller like a, like a wing and uh, uh, from the physical point of view the thrust produced by a propeller is not different than lift uh, or produced on the wing except that it is in a different direction. It's in a horizontal direction. So, so uh, uh, because of that and because it propels the vehicle, we call it propel uh, uh, thrust. Um, well, and the last one is, uh, 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 is a rocket engine. Now, the difference between a, this plane and a rocket engine is that uh, in the rocket engine, uh, the ejected material or the, the ejected gas originate actually from the inside of the vehicle. Uh, now, in the, in the jet plane, uh, most of that gas coming out was taken actually in front of the plane. It's uh, hot, I mean, practically, I mean, the chemically it's a different composition, but most of it is uh, air coming out on, I mean, or, or result of reaction of air. So it takes air in front, heats it up, and ejects it on the other side with a slightly different composition. Uh, all right, I think that these, uh, yeah, these, uh, let me check, but I think that these are the all forces I wanted to discuss. Uh, right, so, now how about if we move the screen up, and I want to, to, uh, to see how, how to use, or to show how to use Newton's second law to, to make various predictions about what will happen in the, with, the, uh, with the object. Why don't we actually uh, try to figure out uh, what, I mean, let's say that we have a, an inclined surface and a block over here and try to find out how it is going to, to move or, or how, what conditions are needed so that it doesn't move. Let's start with this, that it doesn't move. What conditions for the surface do we need? Let's say that this angle is given uh, and let's call it alpha. Let's say that we know mass of this object um, and uh, coefficient of static friction between the two surfaces and coefficient of kinetic friction uh, between the uh, two uh, surfaces. We know it because I, I noticed that some of you, if, you if, if I say that something has value A, you are trying to change the value to 1 or to seven. Uh, uh, 
algebraic, I mean, I prefer actually that, that when you solve problems, first you solve problems algebraically uh, using uh, symbols and then at the end plug in the numbers because if you make a mistake in calculations, it is very hard to find that mistake if you plug in, plug in numbers. It's much easier to find it when you uh, uh, solve it algebraically. All right, so let's now say, uh, is this a question, is this object going to stay on the surface with this given information? Uh, well, the first thing which we have to, to do uh, in the analysis is to uh, identify the forces, draw the uh, free, uh, free body diagram. Would somebody, would somebody uh, agree actually to, to suggest forces? You do? H why don't you shout actually? Yes, so shout what, what forces I should draw. Uh, gravity moving. Gravitational force, okay? Gravity is not moving, it's directed. Okay, so we have gravitational force. How about if I mark it over here? I mean, we can mark it here or there. Oh, let's do it here. Yeah, so we have gravitational force directed downward. I will call it weight. <coughs> Although, as I said precise, precisely, it is, uh, it's, uh, it's a different uh, concept. What else? Normal force directed perpendicular to your surface. Normal force perpendicular, uh, uh, directed perpendicular to the surface. Um, and? And the frictional force, and it is hard to say which one. Uh, well, the question was, is it going to stay still? Which means that it should be static friction. So I would have to, to imagine that I, I make a static friction, static friction, and I know that there is a limit for this static friction, magnitude of this static frictional force. All right. Uh, so... What else? That's it. Remember to make the decision, that's it. Uh, now, that drawing actually illustrates the situation. For the analysis, it is better now to think in terms of numbers. Uh, and in order to do this, when we analyze vectors, what do we call those numbers? S not scalars. Scalar, not coefficients, but you are on the right track. Scalar components, right. So let's now assign scalar components uh, to each of those, uh, of those vectors. Well, in order to do this, we have to do something else first. What is it? Put down the coordinate system. Make it in a smart way, though. Yeah, so, so it would be probably smart to make x in this direction, y in this direction, and z in this direction, right? No, it would be it would be smart because we want to. I mean, it, it is smart to do it in such a way that uh, that we get simple numbers which we can easily add. For example, what are the numbers which are easily add? Uh, zero is good. So so choose a coordinate system that we have as many zeros as we can. Well, then I will choose it this way. X. Oh x along the ramp and uh, y perpendicular to the ramp z toward us. So what are the scalar components of uh, normal force in this direction, uh, in this uh, reference frame? Zero, not one. Zero and zero for z, and we don't know what will be what will be uh, y component. Uh, I can put actually n sub y to indicate that it is y component, and then I don't care if it is positive number or negative number, or I can even express it in terms of magnitude. So I can think about magnitude of normal force, and I recognize that if y is in this direction, y component must be equal to the uh, magnitude. So I can put a symbol for magnitude over here. Do you understand me? All right. So we took care of normal force. How about this frictional, uh, static frictional force? 
Well, we know that z is going to be 0. Uh, how about y is going to be 0? How about z? Uh, we don't know. I can write down here that this is x component, so f, s, f sub s x, or I can exp express it in terms of magnitude. However, if I express it in terms of magnitude, I have to be consistent with my coordinate system, or our coordinate system. Uh, so I can recognize that x component of this frictional force has to be negative. Can you see that? Therefore, if I want to use magnitude, I will have to put minus magnitude. So x component is opposite to magnitude. All right, weight is actually the most complicated now. <coughs> one, is, uh, one component is zero. Which one? Z. Z component is zero. Well, now for x and y, we have to uh, call trigonometry. I can recognize if this angle is alpha, and also this angle is alpha. Right, so x component of the weight would be this vector. It's along x-axis. And y component is this vector. So help me now to write it down. Uh, x and y component. And why don't we do it also in terms of magnitude of that weight? Uh, ma mass is uh, given over here, so, so magnitude of weight will be mass times acceleration due to gravity. Right, so it will be mg, and uh, so I will have mg over here and mg over here, and multiply by appropriate trigonometric function. Maybe I will make this bigger a little bit. mg. <laughs> M, G, zero. All right. So for X component, I can recognize that I will have to multiply magnitude by sine of, the, of that angle. So I will multiply it by sine of the angle. And, <coughs> well, so far all of these are positive numbers. However, I mean, for me, it is a component. So right now I have magnitude. Uh, is component, well, not magnet, uh, I mean a positive number, is, 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 po is the component positive here? Positive, yes, yeah, so I leave it like it is. Now for the, uh, using trigonometry, I can recognize that this length is going to be this length times cosine alpha. Well, this one is a positive number, though, and I see that the vertical, that this component is Negative, so I have to, to, to include that minus. Uh, all right. Uh, now, actually, no matter what kind of problem I was solving, so far I would be, uh, I mean, about this, situa this uh, system, I would, I would start it the same way up to this point. Now I started to think, what was our question? Is it going to, 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 to stay, right? Is it going to stay? So, uh, uh, <coughs> if it is going to stay, it means that if I add those, uh, those I should get what? Zero. What zero? Zero vector, correct. Which means that th this number plus this number plus this number, so it is zero minus f plus mg sine alpha is supposed to be zero. This is for x component. The same thing has to be true for uh, y component, which means that n plus zero minus mg sine alpha must be zero. And, uh, and the last equation means that z components have to be zero, which means that zero plus zero plus zero must be equal to zero. Well, we got th those three equations which have to be satisfied simultaneously. Uh, well, the last one is, we took care of the last of the z component. The last one is, now, can these two uh, be satisfied simultaneously? Uh, well, 
from here I can find out that the frictional force, magnitude of the frictional force must be equal to mass of the object times free fall acceleration times uh, sine of the alpha and normal force has to be equal to mass times uh, fr uh, acceleration due to gravity. Oh, I did something wrong. Cosine. Cosine alpha. Uh, all right. Now, uh, if it were if it were uh, uh, s uh, static frictional force, which means that this force should not exceed uh, coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force, right? Which means that mg sine alpha must be less than uh, mg cosine uh, alpha multiplied by coefficient of uh, static friction. So from that I solve that coefficient of static friction must be greater, oh it's equal, must be greater or equal to sine alpha over cosine alpha. All right? Now, that number is given. Yeah, I told you what is the condition. If we calculate it now, that this number over here is greater than the, than the uh, ratio of those two trigonometric functions, then what will happen? The object will stay still, right? If we get that this is not true, which means that the object will start to slide. And uh, maybe tomorrow we'll talk about, uh, let's predict how fast it is going to slide. See you tomorrow then.